Well, I completely missed the holidays and any hope of getting a YouTube check this month. What was I doing during that time since I wasn't making videos, you ask? Well... I want to be with you. We still have some time before night falls. Fuck it right- Now, before I go any further, let me say that this list is very subjective. And there are honestly over 20 entries I considered that could all be on this list. So, I had to make some rules. First, no optional maps, meaning all the paralogues in Awakening and Fates, the entirety of Act 6 Echoes, and the Guidance Chapters in Binding Blade will not be on here. If you don't want to get the rewards from those maps, then you don't have to play them. Especially since you could just close that 3DS and play a real man's game like Friendship Simulator 2017. Second rule, which will probably disappoint some of you, no Awakening maps. If you were expecting me to tear into Awakening for its generic map design, I say pair up and validates any issues you could have, except for the lunatic maps, but that's an entirely different issue. So no Naga Tree, even though I actually kind of like that map since it's easily exploitable with Gale Force, like the rest of Awakening, and at least looks pretty in all of its 240p glory, while giving us a moustache to remember. The third rule is only maps from games I have played will be on this list, and I sound very agitated now, because some of you literally have attention spans that do not last more than a single minute, and acted like I didn't say this the last time. And maybe that's why there's nothing from FE4 on here. Has Fortnite damaged your non-intelligent systems that much? Fourth, I remember when I was a teenager too, but you mind watching the whole video before commenting? Because maybe I address what you're thinking later in the video? Or you could just show common courtesy? Is that too much to ask for? That's definitely too much to ask for. Lastly, I'm ranking these maps based on the quantity of bullshit I feel they have, not the quality per se. Because viewer, where we're going, we aren't finding anything of value. Sacred Stones is an easy game, even when picking the difficult setting, which is a bit of false advertising if you ask me. Now, when I play FE8, I always choose the OP Lancelord with 1-2 range over his overrated sister. The bitter cold of winter! Sorry, sweetie, your maps are just lame compared to your twin brothers. However, the price of having more fun in Ethram's path is... Taking a haunted boat ride? That's right, the first and only Sacred Stones entry on this list is Ghost Ship for a few reasons. First, this is the only objectively bad map in Ethram's path, while the rest I feel are solid or mediocre at worst. There's also the fact that if you really don't want to play this map, you can just choose Erica's path, and these reasons are why this map is only number 10. However, there are several major reasons as to why this map is infamous. The first is that it's a Fog of War map, and don't worry, that's only the biggest thing wrong with a lot of these maps. Fog of War, for those who don't know, is when a map limits your visibility, but the enemy has perfect visibility of you, giving the player an arbitrary handicap, which is one of the cardinal sins of gaming. The second issue with this map is the fact that it's a boat map, meaning you have limited space to position your units, which wouldn't be as problematic if the game didn't send swarms of flying units that ignore this restriction, and can use both physical and magic attacks, meaning the Flyer Brigade can't handle this since Taunt and Vanessa will get worn down by being outnumbered, and Cormac goes down if those eyes blink at him. The third issue with this map is that Lara Shell and Dazla appear as green units, meaning you either start saying your Hail Marths or you rush in to go save them. Now, some of you might say to just deploy Ephraim, Seth, Dussel, and Solo- No. I have seen people try low manning this map and it just doesn't work. There are too many enemies and relying on 1-2 range is risky because you only open yourself up to more attacks, making your HP drain faster. So, how do you deal with this? Hail Marth Warren Arcanea Hollowed be like NAGA FUCKING damn it! I'm writing parts of this script at 2am because circumstances have made scripting in the day a near impossible feat for me now, so I'm forced to deal with this battle before dawn. Battle Before Dawn is a Fog of War defend chapter that expects you to split your army. In three-fourths of the difficulties, this is more tedious than bad, hence the lower raking. But the Hector Hard Mode version? 
No, that gets my full wrath. In this difficulty, splitting up couldn't be a worse idea since you need all the manpower you can muster as the enemies are not screwing around. However, you won't fight every enemy as Jafar and Nino are on this map, but this is where strategy gets thrown out the window. Jafar will face enemies with about a 30% hit rate or closer to 20% in actuality, but Jafar faces so many enemies that he'll inevitably take a few scrapes. After a few turns, the real threats roll in as multiple Sword Slayer fighters will attack Jafar and take a third of his health with over a 50% chance to do so. That's right people, Jafar has a very real possibility to die before you can even reach him. And as if that wasn't enough bullshit, Nino can get hit by a 1-2% critical, prompting a swift restart. First we have to reach turn 5, where Zephyr will face a fighter and an archer for 2 turns, as mounted units won't even be able to reach him until turn 7, which is a tight window since at turn 8, a mercenary, not might, not maybe, but will kill Zephyr if he didn't die to the other two units already. This makes taking the left path ideal as you can reach to far sooner and avoid the bitch. But look, Maxime wants to have a surprise party and holy crap, why is he this strong? Even using your best units, this fucker will take several rounds of combat to kill, slowing your pacing significantly. But you made it to turn 13, you reach Zephyr, and wait, why is the boss music playing? Are you afraid to die? Why? Why does she start moving now? You did everything right, but no. The sexy crow decides to move at the last minute, pick off your weakened units, or can go for Zephyr where- Oh, look, he lived on 1 HP with bolting. Nope, he gets doubled. Surprise. And as if all that I said already wasn't some bullshit, this map suffers from the worst case of if you had this syndrome, as the four chests on this map would have been significantly more useful in a prior map. One chest contains a pair of boots which you can give to a mounted unit to reach Zephyr faster, another contains a Brave Lance which would make Maxime much easier to deal with, the third chest has a Delphi shield meaning you don't need to have a mini heart attack anytime you see an archer show up, and the fourth one has... No. Oh, that's how you know the devs knew how awful this map was. Radiant Dawn. I know some of you think I love this game because I've praised its mechanics, but I could easily make a top 10 worst FE10 chapters video because of how monotonous the map design is. Right now, we're gonna look at a map that can be fixed with one simple change. Unwanted Glory, or the Swamp Map as I'm sure many of you know it as, makes many small mistakes that put together bog down the chapter's quality, pun fully intended. This map is, of all things, a rescue mission where the objective is to try and save the prisoners in the middle of the marsh. Since you got Jill earlier, you can just use her flyer mobility to intercept the enemy wyverns and rescue the prisoners. Is what I would say if Jill was playable on this map. You see, since the average player lacks the 200 IQ needed to understand this decision, we are left wondering why you don't get to use a regular flyer, but instead are forced to use Vika, a Raven Lagoos, who can't transform until turn 3 without taking damage. Making this worse is that even when transformed, she lacks the strength needed to fight the enemy units and is too frail to take them on, especially if she rescues someone. The only reason this map isn't higher on the list is because saving the prisoners is optional, and all you lose with their deaths is some bonus experience. The Dawn Brigade is starred for that stuff, but your best bet is to play this map normally, which still involves fighting way too strong enemies at this point in the game, with constant reinforcements and limited movement. Also, I hate how Micaiah gets all the glory at the end for nothing. If anything, Soth is the real hero for putting up with this crap. I wonder how he does it. A while back, I made a top 10 talking about my favorite Fates chapters, but no one watched it, so I never bothered to talk about my least favorites. However, today, I introduce all of you to the many circles of Fates Hell. Unfortunately, our tour guide to the underworld only has time for one stop, so instead of going to Fox Hell, Flyer Hell, or taking the stairway to Hell, we're stopping off at Ninja Hell. Because ninjas make everything better, right? Ninja Hell is a map where you divide your army to seize the throne, but doing so requires facing hordes of ninjas, mechanists, and freaky looking puppets that all want to drop your stats. 
Here, you need units that can afford losing 3 to 4 defense points, randomly losing 20 or even 40% of their max health, and have the hit rate to retaliate, since you won't be able to reach the end with tanking alone. This means most of the map consists of Camilla parking her thick ass on a choke point, using her retainers for support if you've promoted them, running to Elise for healing, then going back with Azura's dance. That alone is awful, but there are three additional gimmicks on this map. The first are the dragon veins used to block off certain pathways while opening others. Not that bad, but it falls flat since using the dragon veins is too risky, as you might accidentally open a weak spot that you can't cover. The second gimmick is exclusive to Ninja Hell, and it's the use of Caltrops. To get rid of the damage dealing, movement reducing, avoid sapping caltrops, you need a frail lock touch unit to remove them. The last gimmick is... Saizo. He joins as a green unit and if he survives, you get a speed wing, which I'm sure some of you might not have known about since his AI is... weird. Sometimes he survives with no issue, and other times he'll kamikaze into the enemy. Just don't let him reach the boss. Which is the main reason why this map is on the list. You could kill all the ninjas, smash all the puppets, outwit all those bullshit lunge sword masters, and it could be for nothing once you reach this guy. Kotaro, just on a hard mode, has 50 base evasion, but he's also on the throne, which jacks it up to 80. On top of that, he's surrounded by Caltrops at 1 to 2 range. Oh, isn't that so perfectly bullshit? All the frustration that culminates at the end, which could lead to all of your time being for naught, is why this map is on the list. From here on out, the maps I talk about are undeniably deserving of the title of Worst Fire Emblem Map, and honestly, how you personally rank them comes down to how you want your head served to you. I can only think of a few places worse than the middle of a sandstorm. Arcadia. Maybe it's because I've played you on hard mode where you honestly might be easier thanks to hard mode bonuses that show I'm a lady's a goddess, but that doesn't excuse your sins. Arcadia is a triple threat map featuring a desert, fog of war, and the best mechanic in any video game, an escort mission. I've already explained why the fog of war is bad, but for newer fans of the series, let me explain why GBA slash Tellius desert maps are especially awful. In the older FE games, deserts are treasure troves filled with the relics of a bygone era that will greatly aid your army if you find them. So, how do you go about finding these treasures? Well, first you're gonna need a guide, as I have no idea how on L means green earth they expected people to find these things without one. Maybe it was a plan to sell more strategy guides, which from a business perspective makes sense, but is incredibly scummy from all others. And it's not like you should ignore these finds either, as you can get good items like speed wings, a silver card, and DAS BOOTS! Now, to get these items, you need to go to the respective area on the map where your units have a 1 in 11 chance of finding them, except for thieves who have 100% odds. But, guess what units are slowed by the sand and don't even have promotions in FE6? Yeah. Now, some of you are probably wondering, why is there a picture of Sophia next to the guiding ring? That would be the escort portion of this map. You are to escort this unit whose speed is halved, meaning a unit with a dangerous 6 speed can double her, to the marked quadrant on the map so you can get the second guiding ring the game gives you, which is a very coveted promotion item for mages as there are many useful magic units in FE6, and Lelina gets the first one because I'm a biased idiot with the hots for. What makes this escort mission so much more difficult than it needs to be, aside from the fog of war, are the flyers, pre-promote, dragons, and pre-promoted flyers that can come in and one-shot Sophia out of nowhere, making this map a bit of a wild ride. But not as wild a ride as you have at Fugas! This map... If you like this map... What are you on? The gimmick this time is the wind that will do everything in its power to screw you over. There are currents on this map that will push your units this way, that way, and all around, and you're expected to use it to your advantage. Why this does not work is because you're on bridges the whole time, meaning your units have to get in line conga style and are just elongated sausage lengths waiting to be blown over. Even though Conquest gives you plenty of mounted units, there's just not enough space for everyone even if you pair up since the wind covers so much of the map. You can't plan ahead because the constantly changing currents will mess up any strategy you had and force you to look for another path. Usually what happens is you try to play around the wind 
and then the game says, Okay kiddos, time for everyone to move up 5 spaces, causing any previous strategy you had to go out the window, and most likely send your units into an early grave. The reason I loathe this map so much is because I've played this on Lunatic. It took me dozens upon dozens of tries over the course of a week to finally beat this damn map, get all the treasure, kill all the souped up units and waves upon waves upon ocean's gray waves of reinforcements and take down this bald headed, bead wearing, sorry excuse of a representation of Switzerland's neutral asses and get through the worst filler map in all of Fire Emblem. Can we not let the intern ever design a map again? All these terrible maps are draining me just from thinking about them. So, I'm going to make all of you suffer with me from a bad pun now, because I need a reason to write. Who said this was okay? Who okayed the idea of a Fog of War river map with Lagu's units for the Dawn Brigade to fight? Chapter 6 and Part 3 of Radiant Dawn, A Reason to Fight, highlights everything wrong with Radiant Dawn's design philosophy. Since Radiant Dawn tries to tell the tale of multiple different groups, no single group can hold a spotlight for too long, and this map shows why quality is better than quantity. You cannot be expected to raise up this band of schmucks, which is just 5 people initially, of which the majority of its members are questionably legal at best. Even after using the statistically worst FE Lord since Roy, Knife Jagan, your speed growth is not 60% no matter how much the game says it is, Myrmidon lol, and a walking Draco shield, this group does not get any better. From then on, you get a healer with paper bones, inferior Nephany, insert family guy joke here, promoted Myrmidon, Jill, and the only unit that everyone can agree is irredeemable. It's not just the Fog of War that has me hate this map. It's not the Lagus that curb stomp your units, not the river restriction that limits your movement options, but it's the blatant disadvantage you are at. Whenever I, and probably many of you watching play Radiant Dawn, I'm preparing for this map and trying to figure out how I can have this ragtag group kill 47 Lagus units why that many I'll never know, and make it out in one piece. This map shows the importance of having proper experience distribution and unit balance, and this map is this high up because it is the climax of all the poor decisions made in part 1 that blow up in the player's face and make a truly unenjoyable experience. Alright. I'm done talking about Fog of War, but from here on out, no more single entries. That's right, the next three segments will discuss the design faults in multiple maps, since they have the same mistakes that the dev team didn't learn from the first time, and where better to start than the end of all. If I'm the Ocean's Grey Waves, that the end game of Conquest is a black tsunami with how brutal it is. The reason I put both Chapter 27 and Endgame together is because you have to be both in one shot. But I'll start with Endgame as there is much more to explain here. In the Endgame for Conquest, you fight the only 3DS FE final boss that isn't a dragon, which I think is a bigger plot twist than what happened to Takumi. The objective of this map is to kill whatever Takumi has become and lay his angsty soul to rest, but that is much easier said than done people, as before you can even reach Takumi, you have to break through the incredibly strong and diverse array of enemies that can kill your units in just a few rounds of combat. Naturally, when faced against multiple strong opponents, your first instinct is to turtle your way through, but that doesn't work because if you take too long, as in don't immediately bum rush Takumi, Faceless spawn in and have a unique skill that has them blow up if you don't kill them in a single round. Alright, so like I said, just rush him, right? Well... Strong enemies aside, Takumi likes to fire an energy wave of all things that will cripple your units if they aren't behind cover. Go too quickly, your units get destroyed on enemy phase. Go too slowly, you die to kamikaze faceless. Even if you somehow reach Takumi in one piece, he's no slouch, especially since he has the most broken skill in all of Fire Emblem. Awakening Para. Because, you know, 
Having all your progress thrown out the window because you died to the final boss is such a great feeling, isn't it? Especially since dying here means you must slog through another 10 minutes of chapter 27, which is pathetically easy but just a massive waste of time. I hope Three Houses Endgame isn't as big a screw-up as Conquest was. You might have noticed the common theme in these chapters, and that's my dislike of unfair mechanics that benefit the enemy. But there's also another theme, and that's restrictive movement. Where else is this best present aside from those damn bridge maps in Tellius? Wait no longer, viewers, as I'm finally going to tear these maps a new one. Although that won't do much, since there's already so many pitfalls in them. The Tellius bridge maps are infamous for being some of the worst maps in Fire Emblem, and I can't help but agree. Let's start with the Path of Radiance version. Here, you have only three flying units max, however, they can't do much since the enemy have ballistae and snipers that rain down on you constantly. As an added bonus, they like to throw in some mages to cause even more mayhem. On top of that, this map has reinforcements and even has Har show up with said reinforcements, meaning you have to leave Jill, one of your flying units, behind to recruit him and then kill said reinforcements. So, you have two flying units to take on this map. Fun. Radiant Dawn is also on my shit list though, because they did nothing to fix the issues in Path of Radiance, and honestly, they made them even worse here. In this version of the map, you have even less space to move than in Path of Radiance, the enemies use shine barriers to cut off your few available paths, and the best part about both maps is that the enemy is completely unaffected by the pitfalls, which is miles worse than the Fog of War benefits. At least with Fog of War, you had ways to get around it with thieves and torches, but here, there's just no escape. And to make it even worse in the Radiant Dawn version, there are times where your path can be completely cut off, and you are forced to use Sigurd and Tanith, who are required by the way, to rescue your units across these points. I'd be okay with this if Tanith still had reinforced, and her and Sigurd weren't bad units in this game. However, these maps are higher up for one reason, and that's because you can easily make this one of the better maps in the Telia series with a simple fix. Have the AI stop in front of the pitfalls so you know where to avoid. There, problem solved! You now have actual strategy in a strategy game, and don't just use a guide to avoid the traps! But you know what the worst part about these awful maps is? There's something worse than this. And oh boy, is it something special. Fire Emblem Echoes. Normally, this is the point where someone who doesn't understand this fanbase would put this game in the trash for being so radically different. However, I am no fool, and I know that bashing this game would be unwise. And also not something I believe in. Oh, don't get me wrong, the Gaiden fanboys, except for this shredded beast, embody the typical elitist mindset of blindly defending the blatant flaws in this game and saying it can do no wrong. However, on the opposite side of that coin, newcomers in the series are put off by how radically uncongenial this game is. No weapon triangle, promotion through shrines, Magic using HP? I'd say no weapon durability, but Fates desensitized us to that, and it seems to be returning in the next FE game. At least, that's what my fever dream told me, but it's the same way I predicted this feathery shredded beast would get into heroes, so I trust it. While Echoes is different, I wouldn't say it's a bad game, and I'll go out of my way to say that this game has my favorite Fire Emblem story, narrative, and art design out of any FE game. Period. The voice acting in this game is in a league all its own, and Ian Sinclair's performance as Burkut? An absolute delight to the ears. Alm and Celica may be flawed people, but that's what makes them great characters. And it's not just the main lords, as there are so many great characters, and the voice acting in this game helps give the dynamics between a lot of the duos in this game so much more depth. So, why am I going on about all the positives and echoes? It's because Celica's path is the biggest mistake that keeps this game from being extraordinary. 
This game had everything going in its favor, but some dipshit at Intelligence Systems decided that leaving the awful, barren, uninteresting squares in Gaiden intact for some incomprehensible reason. And here's the thing, Alms Path, honestly not that bad. He even has some good maps like the finale of Act 1 and the last two battles of Act 4. Not bad, but everything else is simple except for you, ya whore, but at least I have Mila's RNG machine to allow me to reset until I inevitably crit you with Double Lion. Celica's Path. Let's just get into it. Act 2. It's mostly shitty boat maps. Just boat map after boat map after boat map. You could tell how little thought went into these maps when one of them is literally a boat map with a single canter as the only enemy on it because that's game design, right? Act 3, shitty desert maps. And no, it doesn't matter that you get two flyers to help you circumvent the fact that literally everyone else has one or two movement because you have to dredge through the sand to reach a fortress that gives the enemy an additional 20 avoid and is filled to the brim with snipers. Miller's turn wheel isn't an option here. You are required to use it to try and kill the problematic enemies with criticals or if single RNG just fucks you in the ass. Act 4, okay. Let me spoil the identity of the Mass Knight here as if anyone with a brain couldn't figure out that it's Celica's retconned half-brother. Intelligent Systems, you're telling me that it is a good idea to give Celica a Cavalier as she is about to go into more swamp maps that already restrict her other unit's movement, but affect Cavaliers the most? You want me to use a horse unit that is not a Bow Knight to fight off the multiple canters in these maps? Unironically. I don't know what else to say. This? This is an abomination, but oh, you thought I forgot about Revelations, didn't you? <laughs> I fucking wish. Oh my goodness, where do I begin with this game? How about the bullshit two-part chapter in the middle of the game that you have to clear in one try or else you restart both of them? What about the snow shoveling map? Maybe that first map in Vala that tells you that this path only exists to jerk off the royal some more. Or how about Metal Gear emblem that exists only to waste your time as you pick the wrong door at the end? Or my personal favorite... Celica's Path and Revelations are my least favorite map in Fire Emblem. They're not fun, they're not well designed, they are textbook examples of why adding gimmicks into your maps ruins the chapter in its entirety. I'm the Omniblade, and I'm out of eggnog, meaning I am a sad boy. But not as sad as the people who are playing the Sins of Man. So... Pretty hot take, right? <laughs> so here we reach the end of the video where I don't really know what to say now. My hands are freezing since I'm recording this last bit literally hours before the video goes up. Hopefully, hopefully hours before it goes up. And that, yeah, this might be one of the last videos I do in a while just because it's starting to wear down on me. All of the negativity just because the vast majority of people seem to enjoy you don't have to agree with me to enjoy the videos, I hope, but I mean, hopefully it doesn't upset you that much. If it does, get some help. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's starting to wear me down, all the negativity and stuff. And I just enjoyed myself a lot when I was playing Persona 5, and that made me realize that what I really want to do is, like, just talk about whatever I want. Like, I think the biggest channel, I guess, is the word I would put, I aspire to be like, is relax, relax, just because his quality is godlike, his content is always great, no matter what the topic is, and he's just entertaining and goes about whatever topic he wants, and that's kind of the stuff I want to do, like, it's like kind of reviews, but like not really at the same time, and it's just, currently I only do top tens because that's what I know how to do, just because it's just, it's a clip show, it's a glorified, do you have the patience and balls to put your opinions online with a decent enough mic, I just... I don't know how much I repeated myself there, but I'm I'm not going to leave those audio waves in. Yeah, I sound a lot quieter just by looking at this, but... Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll find the gumption to go at it, depending on if this risk pays off, and if not, then, yeah, I think I'm going to have to look in something else to do. Alright, 
Uh, not like any of you care about this stuff anyways. I'm just gonna get out of here. Peace.